Hi folks, welcome back. So one of the most common circuit elements that we've used in this course so far is the humble buffer. Now we've used op-amp buffers a few times, but really op-amps are just a couple of transistors in a clever little box. And in this video, I'm gonna show you how to make a really good buffer using just one transistor. So we don't have to add a split supply into our circuit just for the sake of adding a buffer in. So what do buffers actually do? Well, we usually think of buffers as protecting or shielding our circuits from other circuit elements, but protecting them how? Shielding them from what? What fate will befall our unbuffered circuits if we don't buffer them? Well, let's head over onto the breadboard and find out. So what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna simulate connecting two stages together. I'm gonna to model the output of our first circuit, let's not worry about what it is, as this 2.2K resistor, and I'm gonna model the input of our second circuit as this 4.7K resistor. So we're gonna compare the input and the output now as I connect this load. So you can see they look the same now, and then when I connect that load, oh dear. So we're losing two and a half out of our eight volts, so about 30% of our signal. Why? What's going on? So this is what I've just showed you on the board, and this is how I want us to think about any two stages connected together. Essentially the input of any system looks like a certain impedance, and the output of any system looks like a certain impedance. And so those two things form a voltage divider, and classic voltage divider rules, the voltage is dropped in the same ratio as the two resistors. So we've got basically a two to one ratio here, so the voltage is gonna get dropped in the same ratio. One volt will be dropped across this resistor for every two volts we drop across this resistor. So one third of all the voltage we put in this entire system, we're gonna lose across this Z out, because the voltage across Z in is what is read by the next circuit. So this is where our buffer comes in. What we do with buffers is we build ourselves a special little circuit that sits in between these two impedances and it has a nice high input impedance and a nice low output impedance. So if this has a very high input impedance, then this voltage divider at the input, all of the voltage gets dropped across the input of the buffer and because it's got a very low output impedance, this second voltage divider here all of the voltage gets dropped across this Z in. But generally what we look for is we try and make our output impedance at least 10 times less than the input impedance of the next stage or better. That way we'll see about 10% attenuation, worst case scenario. So you can probably guess from the title, we're gonna use a transistor to do this. But how can we do that with what we know about transistors? So we're gonna use an MPN transistor. And what do we know about transistors? Well, what we do know is that we got not we've got a 0.6 volt drop across there. And what that means is that any signal that we put here, we will see here, just 0.6 volts lower. So this is what we're gonna use to make our buffer. If we put a resistor here, then we can use this property of the transistor to get an output signal here that looks exactly like the input signal, but the transistor is separating us from the input circuitry. So can we just put a signal in that looks like this around ground? No, we can't, because remember, if we go below this 0.6 volts, the transistor will turn off. So what we do is we do a thing called biasing. We use a voltage divider to set the base of the transistor at a voltage so that it's always on, and then we use a capacitor to superimpose the input signal onto that bias voltage, we call it. So if this bias voltage is sat, it's gonna be at around five volts. So it'll be at five volts, and then when we apply our input signal, it'll look like this. And then at the output, the output will sit 0.6 volts below that, and then it should go up and down exactly with the input signal. And so now we've, I've built up a different circuit, but you can see we've still got this 4.7K load here, and it's still being driven by this 2.2K source. But now if we look on the oscilloscope, we can see that the output, the blue trace, follows the input, the yellow trace, almost perfectly. And that's where this circuit gets its name from. This is called an emitter follower, and is what we're gonna use as our transistor buffer. Okay, so this is that circuit I just showed you. So here's our source resistance of 2.2K. Here's our load resistance of 4.7K. So we're gonna assume that we're stuck with these loads and we can't just change them to make our lives easier. So the thing with transistors, we've got lots of variables. We've got three unknown resistors and we've got an unknown capacitor. And we need to set all these values in a way that's gonna make this source resistance look really small to this load. Hmm, okay. So where do we even start with this? Well, first things first, let's talk about assumptions. We're always making assumptions in engineering and this is no exception. So I'm gonna assume there's a voltage drop from the base to the emitter of 0.6 volts. So that's a pretty reliable thing to assume actually. It will very often be in the range of kind of 0.5 to 0.7. That's why I just split the difference and go for 0.6. The second assumption we're gonna make 
is that the current gain of the transistor, beta, is 100. Why 100? A, 100 is a nice round number. B, on the data sheet, the, I'm gonna use a 2N3904. On the data sheet, beta is given as 100 to 300 typical values. So I'm picking the smallest number that it can reasonably be. So that way, if it's higher than that, the circuit will actually work better. I find for any small signal transistor, so I'm talking 2N3904s, 2N2222s, um, all those kind of things, basically not power transistors, assuming a bit of 100 is a pretty reasonable thing to do. Um, you can look on the data sheet and find the lowest typical value for beta. You might see it written as HFE. It will be called the DC current gain, okay? And I'll go into why this is important later on. Okay, so the first thing we need to do is we need to set up what the transistor is going to do before we have any input signal applied at all. Okay, this is called the quiescent state, or you might see it called the Q point. Quiescent is just fancy Latin for, you know, dormant, inactive. What is happening here? Well, when we've got no input signal applied, we're at DC, aren't we? If we've got no AC signals applied, and check out my capacitors video if you want to know more about this, but at DC, capacitors look like open circuits. So that basically disconnects all this stuff from the circuit, so we don't have to worry about it while we're setting up the DC bias. So the first thing we want to do is we want to set the output, which is this point here, this little symbol means the output, so that at DC, it sits between the supply voltage and ground. Why we want to sit in the middle is so that we can swing up and down by the same amount without clipping at the top or the bottom, without having the top or the bottom, you know, cut off. Okay, so we want to set this point to 4.5 volts. So how do we go about doing that? So if we go back to our assumptions, we can see that this point here is going to be 0.6 volts higher than this point here because we're losing 0.6 volts to this VBE. So we know we want to put this point here to 5.1 volts. Okay, so how do we do that? Well, we've got this nice voltage divider here. So we need to set these two resistors at a ratio where they'll divide this nine volts down to 5.1 volts. Now there's lots of handy calculators online if you don't like the maths, so I'm not gonna go into the maths here. But what I will tell you for free is that we want a ratio of R1 to R2 of one to 1.3. And that will set this point at 5.1. Now I haven't told you the exact values yet, because if we remember back to what I was talking about earlier about our impedances, we're forgetting this stuff because we're at DC. So we've got these two resistors are driving the base of the transistor, aren't they? And so the combined impedance of these two needs to be 10 times less than this. Otherwise, we're going to lose loads of voltage to this voltage divider. So we don't want that to happen. But until we work out what this impedance looks like, we can't pick exact values. So we'll pick this ratio and we'll come back to it in a minute. So now we know we've got 4.5 volts here. Then we want to pick this resistor so that that will then set the current through the transistor, okay? What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pick this RE so that we get one milliamp. So why one milliamps? Well, for this circuit, it's not hugely critical, so I'm just picking it because it makes the numbers easy. We'll go into it more in future videos. In the order of a half a milliamp to a couple of milliamps is fine. For RE, I'm gonna pick 4.7K because that's the closest thing I can get to 4.5K and 4.5 volts divided by 4.5K will give us one milliamp. So that's just Ohm's law. If V equals IR, then that means that I equals V over R, just rearranging this. So now we can work out what this impedance looks like looking into the base. So what the current gain means is that this current that flows through here is this many times bigger than the current that flows into the base. So if we've set this current at one milliamp, then that means that this current that flows in here is gonna be about 10 microamps, because that's one milliamp divided by 100. What that means is that if we're then applying 5.1 volts at this point, and we're having 10 microamps drawn from us, what kind of a resistor does that look like? So now if we rearrange Ohm's law for R instead of for I, we get R equals V over I. So now we can just do 5.1 volts divided by 10 microamps, and that will give us about 500K. And so the rule of thumb here is to look at the impedance at the emitter and multiply it by the current gain, and that's the impedance you see here. So let's call this 470K. Well, there's a screamingly obvious problem here, hopefully, which is that, well, Mr. Audiofool, what happens when we connect the load? I've got the load disconnected, but we're obviously gonna connect the load up. And now you can see, if you're looking down at the emitter, these two are in parallel, and because they're the same value, the total impedance here is halved. And so that will halve this. And this is a massive trap. If you just test up your little circuit element in isolation, 
and then you connect it up and you're not thinking about what your loads are, you could be in big trouble. So these transistors are very clever, but they're not magic. You still have to think about what you're doing. Okay, so instead of 470K, this actually looks like 235K. Okay, so now we know that we want the parallel impedance of these two to look 10 times less than 235K. So now we can pick two values and I'm gonna pick values of 39K and 51K. So that suits our, this ratio, and they also have a parallel impedance of 22K or less. So this is pretty nifty, right? So what we've essentially done is through the current amplifying properties of the transistor, we've made this RE look in isolation about 100 times bigger in reality because of our load. We've just made it look 50 times bigger, but that's still good. Um, and obviously we could have picked this RE to be a, cert a value so that when you connect the load, it doesn't massively change the impedance. I wanted to put this trap in there because hopefully you'll remember it a bit better in the future. Now we can finally apply our input signal. So I'm going to assume that we've picked a capacitor value that won't interfere with our input signal. I'll go into that in just a second. This capacitor looks like a short circuit to signal frequencies because we've selected it to be that way. So essentially we can ignore this and just think that this looks like a, just a piece of wire. And so now we've got this resistance here driving this circuit. And so what does it see? Well, don't fall into the trap of thinking, right, so these two are hopefully obviously in parallel. I could forgive you if you then thought that this was in series, the base of the transistor, this 235K, but it's actually in parallel with these two guys. So what I can do to make that a bit more obvious to us is I can simplify this voltage divider. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna imagine if I were at this point looking in, what do I see? Well, I see these two in parallel and we see a voltage of 5.1 volts. I can replace the voltage divider itself with the equivalent impedance, which is those two resistors in parallel. So this means R1 in parallel with R2, and that was 22K. And then I can replace this voltage with the voltage at the output of the voltage divider. And so as far as the input to the circuit is concerned, this looks exactly the same as it did before. It's just a bit easier for us humans to understand. And now that makes it a little bit more obvious, I hope, that these two resistances are actually in parallel and not in series. So now we can see that the source resistance drives these two in parallel. And because this is 10 times smaller, the parallel resistance just looks like the smaller resistance. So we've got 2.2K driving 22K. This is 10 times bigger than this, so that's good. And then the transistor itself is driving these two guys in parallel. So now the last thing we need to figure out is what, does, what is the output impedance of the transistor itself? And the thinking here is just the opposite way around to when we were looking in at the base. So now what we do is we look this way and we see this impedance here. We see these two in parallel and then we divide by the current gain instead of times. So now we see 22K in parallel with 2.2K. 2.2K is 10 times less than 22K. So the parallel resistance of these two just looks like 2.2K. So we see 2.2K, which are these two in parallel, divided by our current gain 100. So we see an output impedance here of 22 ohms. So now we've got the output of the transistor looks like a 22 ohm load driving these two in parallel, which looks like 2.35K. So that all worked out as well. So this buffer is now working great. So the last thing we need to do is work out this, what value this capacitor needs to be. And now it's quite straightforward because this capacitor forms a high pass filter with these two in parallel, which we know just looks like 22K. So if we wanna pick the center frequency of 10 Hertz, let's put it at, well below the lowest frequency we wanna pass, which is 20 Hertz, because that's the lowest frequency that you can hear. That equation is one over two pi times the resistance that the capacitor is coupled with times the frequency that you want it at. So that would be one over two pi times 22K times 10 Hertz. And that comes out at about 0.7 microfarads. So a one microfarad capacitor would do just great there. Okay, so now that we've seen how we design it, why don't we go up on the breadboard and have a bit of a closer look at the circuit itself. So the first thing I wanna show you is this bias point. So here we see we're at five volts per division. So one, two, three, four and a half is just there. So we're, we're just about on there, maybe a hair under and the 5.1 looks about right. So 
we're within 5%, which is more than good enough. You know, we've got 5% tolerances on all of our resistors, so we can't realistically expect to be bang on. Anywhere inside 5%, we're more than happy with. Let's apply our input signal and have a look at what it looks like. So we can see here, this is absolutely beautiful. And then we see if I just move the output, I'm just moving this on the scope to remove that VBE drop. We can see that the output is exactly what the input is. The actual voltage itself is lower by one VBE drop, but we can see that the output moves the exact same amount as the input. And so that's why we call it an emitter follower because the emitter follows the base. Okay, great. So we can see here how we've got our 2.2K load and we're driving ultimately this 4.7K load. And apart from losing one VBE drop, we're absolutely fine. Okay, so I just want to do a really quick recap of what we've gone through because I know we've gone through a lot of detail just then, but really it boils down to two key points. So the first thing we need to do is we set our quiescent point or our operating point or whatever you want to call it. So we set this voltage here knowing that we'll lose 0.6 volts and that that will set this voltage. Okay, and then once we've set the quiescent voltage, that quiescent voltage through RE sets the quiescent current, which for now, we're just being lazy and conventional and we're setting it at one milliamp. So we're picking this resistor to set the current at one milliamp, also remembering and being careful about the fact that RE will one, be paralleled by the load, so be careful there, and two, will set the input impedance for the transistor which we want to be as high as possible. The next thing we do is once we've got that information, we know the input impedance to the transistor and we know the voltage that we want here. That allows us to pick these two resistors, which will then in turn allow us to pick this capacitor, which we just pick knowing that it forms a high pass filter with these two resistors. And so we set that high pass filter nice and low so that we don't filter out any low frequencies out of our audio signal. So then, We've got this 5.1 volts and what we're doing is we're using the capacitor to superimpose our input signal onto the input. Then the voltage at the emitter changes by the same amount that the input voltage changes and we see that voltage across the load. And that's all there is. So you might be wondering what happens when we put the load elsewhere. We can take the load from the collector. We can put the load in the collector. That's what we're going to do next time. So please come back and check that out. Thank you so much for watching. If you want to see that next video as soon as possible, if you head over to my Patreon and support me on there, my lovely patrons get access to all my videos early. So go and check it out. I've got extra stuff on there and all sorts of lovely stuff. If not, then please like, share, subscribe, all that lovely stuff. And I will see you all next time. Bye bye.